to do. Bonjour, bienvenue. Good afternoon and welcome. Thank you for being with us today on this uh, end of uh, year to welcome our guest today. My name is David Malone. I am um, extremely fortunate to work here at IDRC. Joining us today, uh, we have a wonderful guest, and he came to see us for other reasons, but uh, he very kindly agreed uh, to have this public engagement with all of us uh, in the room. And Monique, very nice to see you here. Uh, Monique Bejan, who is a former Minister of Health of Canada. Um, uh, Marwan Mouacher is um, a man of many different uh, talents. He was reminding us uh, at lunch that he has a PhD in computer engineering uh, from Purdue University, actually. And he moved from that into uh, being a journalist uh, for the Jordan Times in uh, Amman, which I used to read regularly and in which I published once or twice a very good English language paper of its uh, region. Um, he uh, rapidly moved on to the uh, interface of politics, uh, international uh, relations at a high level, and the practice of diplomacy. He did a number of things in diplomacy, but one of them was open the uh, Jordanian embassy in Israel. And he moved on very rapidly to be the Jordanian ambassador to the United States. Uh, as a politician, he's, he's uh, sat in the Jordanian Senate. He has been foreign minister of his country. <coughs> And uh, he was deputy prime minister for primarily for reform and uh, administrative uh, effectiveness uh, issues. Most recently, he was vice president at the World Bank for external relations, a very coveted post. Only one person can hold at a time. Uh, so you frustrated many others by uh, accepting that job, Marwan. And now to the in light of his friends at IDRC, um, he has moved to the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, an extraordinary institution that's part of the constellation of Carnegie uh, nonprofits. And this one has built up um, terrific credibility for itself by engaging long term with a variety of issues and places that reward long term um, in Investment. Russia comes to mind, but there are a number of others. And the Carnegie Endowment for the last four years uh, has extended its activities uh, in the Middle East to create a center in Beirut, uh, parallel to the work of the center in Washington. And um, we've been privileged to support some of their uh, work and hope to go on doing so. Um, Marwan, over to you, and I'm sure there will be an active question and answer period, uh, but we can get to that once you've uh, told us what's on your mind. Welcome again. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Uh, it's actually very nice to leave cold Washington this morning and come to a warmer uh, Ottawa. <laughs> <laughs> it's always a pleasure to be in Canada and uh, to be able to see also so many of old friends uh, and ambassadors of Canada to Jordan. Uh, my uh, lecture today is on uh, Arab moderation, but uh, in fact on redefining Arab moderation as I am not very comfortable uh, with the traditional definition uh, of the term. For Arabs today, the, level, the label moderate applies to only one issue, their position on the Arab-Israeli peace process. Arab states or individuals who pursue or support peace between Israel and Palestinians and other Arabs through peaceful means are known to us all as moderates. Those who do not, either by advocating, supporting, or engaging in violence to end the Israeli occupation, are labeled hardliners. 
as a result, countries like Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and Jordan, to name a few, are considered moderate Arab states, while Syria or non-state actors like Hamas and Hezbollah are considered hardliners. To be sure, the Saudi-Jordanian Egyptian axis has made enormous efforts to achieve peace over the last decade, putting forward such ideas as the Arab Peace Initiative and the Middle East Roadmap. And while the Israelis have talked about being the only party that wants peace, they have made no similar efforts during this period. Instead, they have sought to weaken the idea of negotiated settlements, such as the Israeli separation wall and the disengagement from Gaza. But looking at the broader challenges facing the Arab world today, which also include good governance and political reform, can many of these same above countries still be called moderate? Saudi Arabia's record on women right, women's rights or on political diversity and representative government doesn't suggest a moderate approach. Neither does that of Egypt, when popular political parties such as the Muslim Brotherhood are still banned from elections and hereditary politics seem in play. And the majority in Jordan's political establishment, which has intentionally stifled political institution, hardly seems moderate either. As these examples show, peace is only one challenge facing the Middle East. And while moderates have tackled the peace process directly and valiantly, they have ignored the other critical challenge of state building, developing a system of checks and balances. As a result, the moderates have failed to achieve either goal, and their credibility has suffered as a result. The hardliners, on the other hand, have not offered a better alternative. They tend to adopt rigid policies on both peace and reform, sometimes resorting to arms to make their point. At best, they call for selective reforms that suit only their needs without a clear commitment to the principles of political, cultural, and religious diversity necessary to achieve a lasting peace. Unfortunately, all Arab countries, whether moderates or hardliners in the traditional definition of the, of the term, have largely resisted political reform. Some have initiated ad hoc programs at times to expand certain political freedoms, mostly due to outside pressure. But no Arab country today has adopted a long-term systematic process to encourage the necessary infrastructure for a democratic society, complete with a system of checks and balances, or to allow for true accountability and transparency of the political process. The idea that political reform should be a homegrown process in the Arab world, while I agree with, has long been used as an excuse to take little action. When elections in 2005 and 2006 brought successes for Islamic parties in Egypt and the Palestinian territories, outside pressure abated, and so did work on reform. Much of the resistance to a meaningful reform process has come from the Arab world's political elite, who are eager to protect its privileges under a rentier system that buys loyalty with favors. It does not want the political process to evolve into a merit-based system that will certainly end up robbing it of these privileges. To protect itself, this elite has used the ascendance of political Islam as a convenient scare tactic, both domestically and with the international community. Its argument is simple and effective. See, we told you so. You open up the system, 
And this is what happens. The Islamists come in, is what we have been hearing. And so even when elections take place, such as the November elections in Egypt and Jordan, the laws are designed to protect the elite by producing parliaments that are weak and service-oriented, rather than ones that exercise true oversight of the executive branch of government. Parliaments are never intended to share power with the executive branch or hold it in check against any excesses. Today we are witnessing the grand success of these laws with disastrous effect. The ruling elite, unfettered by a free press, opposition parties, or a vibrant civil society, has grown increasingly closed over the years. The Transparency International Corruptions Perception Index of 2010 lists 12 Arab countries out of 21 with a score of 80 or more, one being the best, out of 170 countries worldwide. As the elite's privileges expanded, so did its interest in protecting them. Self-aggrandizement superseded loyalty to the state and merit as a value. Religious parties filled the void created by the suppression of national non-religious parties, dominating the public sphere alongside Arab governments and complementing the state's role in providing public services. Through their philanthropy and social services, Muslim-based parties constructed a broad and deep base of support. By the time some Arab regimes contemplated political reforms in the 90s, religious groups had already established a significant edge over other civil society groups, which in any case had difficulty gaining traction. The political inertia that was meant to preserve the status quo for the elites at first and later to shield society against radical ideologies produced exactly the opposite effect. A ruling elite increasingly viewed by Arab publics not so much as moderate but unaccountable and the ascendancy of religious groups that use Islam for political purposes. As a result, those who call for pluralistic reform in the Arab world counter with a different argument. See, we told you so. You don't open up the system, and this is what happens. The Islamists, and only the Islamists, come in and garner mass support. There is no excuse for this sorry state of affairs today where other regions of the world have learned to face their challenges and move ahead, even if they are as formidable as the Arab-Israeli conflict, somehow the Arab world still maintains that its special circumstances should allow it to forfeit a meaningful reform process. These two dominant discourses in the Arab world today those of the political elite on one hand and forces that use religion for their own purposes on the other feel increasingly uncomfortable to many in the Arab region. There is a dire need in the Arab world today for a third way, a political force that is moderate across the board. Someone was telling me just now that moderate is not a very sexy word that is proactively moderate, if you want, <laughs> across the board. <laughs> One that is as passionate about reform as it is about peace, as insistent about, about political and cultural diversity as it is about pursuing its objective through peaceful means. Such a discourse is almost absent today from Arab politics if not from the minds and hearts of many Arab citizens. 
Arab political and cultural thinking is also becoming increasingly introverted, thereby ignoring, dismissing, or rejecting interaction with outside civilizations and different schools of thought. Indeed, this self-imposed isolation has left the Arab world behind almost every other region in terms of overall human development, socioeconomic stability, and political reform. And the numbers speak for themselves. However, despite the many challenges facing the region, and the Arab Center in particular, there exists today a unique window of opportunity to spur a new discourse in the region that views diversity as a source of strength, not weakness, for the region, and that pushes for the following multidimensional agenda. A serious homegrown political and cultural reform process, a system of checks and balances where no arm of the state dominates any other one, a stable, peaceful, and economically developed region, and a Middle, society, and a Middle East society that includes all of its citizens and diverse groups. Three main principles comprise this new discourse. Pluralism, peaceful means, and inclusion. A commitment to all three ideals by Arab countries will strengthen the Arab Center and widen its support base across Arab society. Pluralism, a fundamental belief in and commitment to political and cultural diversity across society and at all times. No party has a monopoly on truth or power. No party can impose its cultural views on the rest of society. A commitment to pluralism must include a multi-party system with majority rule and minority rights, an independent judiciary, freedom of the press and expression, application of the rule of law, and a serious respect for human rights. Peaceful means, in each country, pluralism cannot exist unless all parties believe that only the state can carry arms and that no group can pursue its objectives through violent means within each country in the region. This means that non-state actors such as Hamas, Hezbollah, or the various Iraqi armed groups must be fully disarmed and integrated into the political process in their own countries. And on a regional level, upholding peace includes a commitment to resolving the Arab-Israeli conflict through peaceful means. It also means pledging to reject violence, including violence against civilians, whether they are Israelis, Arabs, or others. And inclusion. The Arab world today is a mosaic of ethnic and religious communities. It includes Muslims, both Sunnis and Shiites, Christians of all denominations, Jews, as well as Arabs, Kurds, Armenians, Circassians, Chechens, and Berbers. This moderate discourse must seek an inclusive society for all its citizens and regard the diversity that exists in the Arab world as a positive force. It should also include an unwavering position that women are full participants in development and society with equal rights. To produce this kind of real reform and break the governance deadlock that exists in the Arab world, a gradual approach seems to me is the one that offers the best hope. But gradual should not be synonymous with a turtle-like pace or whimsical ad hoc programs that don't add up to a reform process. Gradual must also mean serious and sustained. One example of such a gradual and serious effort was the Jordanian National Agenda, a blueprint on political, economic, and social reform. The agenda was developed in 2005 by an inclusive committee 
representing a wide spectrum of political, economic, so and social ideologies that included personalities from political parties, parliament, media, civil society, private sector, and the government. The document did not rely on rhetorical statements or initiatives, but suggested specific programs with time <coughs> sorry, timelines, performance indicators, and links to the budget. In the political reform field, it offered a series of changes to laws to open up elections, prevent discrimination against women, encourage freedom of the press, and address other areas through a process that seeks to gradually build a system of checks and balances in the country and move from a rentier system to a merit-based one. It is precisely because of these reforms that the effort was shot down by an entrenched political establishment that did not wish to see its privileges end. Every year, a new government in Jordan informs the public that it is serious about implementing the national agenda. And every year, it fails to do so. Rhetoric is sadly still seen as a sufficient tool to fend off outside pressures or to try to continue deceiving an increasingly skeptical public. One of the many areas where serious reform is most needed is education. Not the quantity of education, but the quality of it. What has been glaringly lacking from Arab educational systems is a curriculum that nurtures the evolution of a healthy concept of citizenship and leads to proper state building by teaching values such as tolerance and the appreciation of diversity and different points of view by encouraging creativity, critical thinking, and research. Instead, Arab children today are taught at a very early age that differences must be suppressed to serve the larger common goals of all Arabs. They learn to think monolithically, one-dimensionally. Critical thinking is neither valued nor encouraged. Truths are always absolute rather than relative. Whole generations have been raised to believe that allegiance to the country means allegiance to the party, system, or leader. That being a good citizen is measured by loyalty to the country's leadership. That diversity, critical thinking, and individual differences are treasonous. Sadly, there exists today an unwritten alliance between the two major political forces in the Arab world, the government and the religious opposition against any serious improvements to Arab educational systems. Both groups want to maintain their monopoly on what children are taught. One which dictates that only their version, only their interpretation of history, religion, and values is the right one. Students are not supposed to question, think, analyze, or consider other interpretations. Thus, neither of these forces has undertaken a serious educational reform process. They have intentionally avoided the core issues and settled for reform at the margins. As a result, the continual improvements Arabs make to the physical infrastructure of education are worthless unless they also make a much greater investment in the human infrastructure of their schools and universities. Without this, reforms in every other area, in my view, will be meaningless. As the Arab-Israeli peace process stalls, and as other needs, such as education reform, arise, Arab moderates must realize 
that they cannot limit their moderation to the peace process and hope to remain credible in their public's eyes. The Arab public must be convinced that a proactive, pragmatic Arab discourse extends to other concerns as well. Good governance, economic well-being, and inclusive decision-making. An often overlooked fact is that the loss of credibility on addressing issues that affect citizens' daily lives has also led to a loss of credibility of the moderate policies of the Arab Center vis-a-vis -vis the Arab-Israeli conflict. Many Arabs thus came to view the, pro the pragmatic position of the Arab Center vis-a-vis -vis the peace process as compromising Arab interests in the service of Western powers rather than as attempting to end the Israeli occupation, establish a viable Palestinian state, and bring much needed stability and prosperity for the region. If the Arab Center is to finally triumph and shake the image its opponents try to paint of it as an apologist for the West or a compromiser of Arab rights, it must start planting the seeds for a time when the peace process will end, but the challenge of creating a robust diverse, tolerant, democrat democratic, and prosperous Arab society will remain. And that time is now. Thank you very much. Uh, Marwan, thank you. Uh, I think you saw that you held the attention of everybody in the room consistently throughout your remarks. Um, a signal achievement at the end of uh, uh, a very intense fall here. Um, for those wishing to intervene or ask a question, the microphones are there and over there by that door. Um, and uh, sir, we'll start with you. Um, first of all, thank you for a very realistic uh, picture of uh, the state of uh, moderation in, uh, in, uh, in the Middle East. Um, I'll make a couple of comments before uh, I ask my Could you introduce yourselves wh when you intervene? Sure. Sorry, I should have made the point earlier. Yes, uh, uh, my name is Raminder Singh. I'm saying that a couple of comments I have before I pose my question to you. One is extremism of all forms whether uh, in uh, in uh, the Middle East, whether in uh, countries like India, where we have also have extremism from the uh, Hindu nationalists, we is, is an impediment uh, in, uh, to to national and individual prosperity and happiness. But how to eliminate? How to? Uh, weaken the power of extremists. Now, the situation in the Middle East, as far as I can recall, goes back way back to when there uh, was... Please, no history. Could you get to your question? Well, because I, there are others standing. Well, I understand. Like I said, I had to make a couple of comments to put my question in context. What I'm saying is that the problem in the Middle East has germinated from the uh, uh, Palestinian lands that have been occupied by Israel. In the meantime, there have been talks to settle the problem, but up until the time the Israel flag flies proudly on Palestine, I'm sorry, the Palestinian flag pr flies proud, proudly on uh, Palestinian lands and independent state, the push towards moderation is going to be an uphill because um, the power of the extremists comes from unrealized or, or, or unhappy residents. So from your point of view, from your last, uh, at one time, Jordan was uh, in war with Israel too. But since then, the track has turned towards moderation. From your um, point of view, what is the impediment now in the way of um, peace in, in, the, in Palestine? Uh, Marwan, would you rather take one or two, or are you, um, uh, because there are several people lining let's take, up. Yeah, let's take so several. So thank you for that. Sir, we'll come to you. Yes, so my name is Leon I'm a retired English professor, so I don't know anything about these issues. <laughs> uh, but I have one question that puzzles me and has puzzled me for a long time, which is the difference between uh, the Arab nations, the Arab world, 
and the European world on the, on the political and social level, which is so great now, but when, say, a few hundred years ago, it was very slight. And I don't know why that is, and I don't suppose anyone does, but one question that bears on the reforms that you're asking for is that in Europe, all of those reforms depended on a rise of commercial uh, industrial middle class. Uh, without that, not, not, none of that would have happened. And does such a class exist in the Arab world? Thank you. Thank you, and perhaps one last one over here. Okay, uh, two questions for me. My name is Ahmed Said from Citizenship and Immigration Canada. Um, my question pertains to s incorporating religious extremist groups or parties within the govern government. Uh, the, I guess the, the premise is that there will be a tempering effect to those sentiments when incorporated. How do you see that function exactly? Say, for example, Hamas or the Muslim Brotherhood being incorporated within a parliamentary system and gaining credibility or acceptance. And the second question deals with um, Turkey. Do you see Turkey as a model for uh, some semblance of balance between religious affiliated parties and democratic systems? And would that be a model that the Middle East or Arab states can follow? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, three very uh, good and important questions. On the role of the Arab-Israeli conflict, um, there's no question in my mind, sir, that the Arab-Israeli conflict continues to be a large and huge impediment to reform efforts and moderation in the region. And as such, I totally agree with you that until that conflict is resolved, the uh, challenge of moderation and reform will uh, certainly be an uphill battle. But I also want to add one thing. There is also no question in my mind that the Arab-Israeli conflict has also been used as an excuse for not moving on reform. As an Arab uh, citizen, I do not want to wait 50 more years before the Arab-Israeli conflict is resolved until I address some of the major challenges facing uh, uh, my own society. What does women empowerment have to do with the Arab-Israeli conflict? Why can't people move on women empowerment? What does the rule of law and, and the equitable treatment of people have to do with Arab-Israeli conflict? There are things that can and must be done without waiting for such a conflict to end, while uh, totally agreeing with your point. On uh, the middle class, I don't want to uh, I don't <laughs> keep repeating that I agree with the <laughs> questioners. I also agree that without the rise of a middle class, uh, there is little hope that uh, we will move on the issue of reform. And I also want to add that for that middle class to rise, we need a system of checks and balances that makes sure that the economic uh, uh, benefits are being distributed in an equitable uh, uh, fashion. Most systems in the Arab world, I say most because I'm trying to be diplomatic, okay. <laughs> uh, most systems in the Arab world have raised the slogan of economic uh, liberalization before political liberalization. Let's put bread on the table uh, and fill people's pockets, and that will make them more moderate and responsible citizens. The result of this policy has been that the economic liberalization and opening up of the system and integration with the global economy without a system of checks and balances has meant that the benefits from such openings have largely went to the cronies of whatever regimes exist and not to uh, the regular citizen. And therefore, if you look at the situation today in the Arab world, the gap between the rich and the poor is far greater than when economic systems were closed. <laughs> and that is a cause of serious worry and serious concern. And that is, in my view, one of the best arguments against this 
uh, this, uh, you know, economy comes before uh, uh, politi uh, political reform. The problem with Hamas and Hezbollah, again, in my view, is not that they are not integrated, incorporated in parliamentary systems of their countries or entities. In fact, they are. Hamas is, is a majority in the Palestinian parliament. And Hezbollah is uh, 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 not a majority, but, but has, uh, has 10 or 12 members in the Lebanese parliament. The problem is not that. That is. That, is the, that should be the case. This is the choice of people, and it should be the case. The problem is that these two organizations have one foot inside the legal system or the political system, and one foot outside it carrying arms. And therefore, Hezbollah in Lebanon today exercises far greater influence than their numbers in parliament because they carry arms. And basically, you know, uh, their view is whether you like it or not, this is how things are going to be, and, and we dictate how things are going to be. And the same goes for Hamas, who now has a separate state uh, in uh, state, mini state, whatever you want to call it, entity in Gaza. So, incorporation into the political systems of their countries is a must. But what is also a must, in my view, is that. You know, such organizations have to choose. Either they want to be political players and therefore they give up their arms, or they don't want to be political players, they want to be opposition parties and carry arms outside the system and not uh, inside it. Turkey as a model is a very interesting case. You know, Turkey for the long time has been viewed rather negatively by Arabs because of the legacy of the Ottoman Empire on one hand, because Turkey turned to the West, g gave up the Arabic alphabet, gave up the caliphate, uh, 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 etc., uh, 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 became close with Israel, etc. And Turkey itself, you know, uh, did not want uh, to maintain its ha historical relations with the Arab world. So for the longest time, Turkey and the Arab world did not view each other with any degree of objectivity. Recently, recently, uh, two developments took place. One, Turkey under the uh, sort of Islamist party of uh, Erdogan decided to open up uh, to the Arab world and adopted this policy of no, you know, zero problems with the neighbors. And as, as a result, ironically, today, for example, Turkey enjoys one of the best relations with Syria, a country with which, historically, it was at great odds. And because of uh, uh, Turkey's prime minister's uh, position on the Arab-Israeli conflict, seen in the Arab world as, as a prime minister who uh, stood up to Israel, who was not afraid to criticize Israel, publicly and forcefully, who sent the flotilla uh, 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 ship uh, to provide humanitarian uh, aid to Gaza, etc. Today, uh, today, the most popular leader in the Arab world is the Turkish prime minister, <laughs> is, not, is not an Arab. However, in terms of Turkey's model, democratic model, a model not without you know, uh, uh, its faults, that is a model that has not been so far looked at seriously by the Arab world because of all the reasons that I uh, 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 talked about. So Erdogan is a popular leader today in the Arab world not because of Turkey's model, but because of Turkey's stance on the Middle East. What, what I hope will happen is that because of this new rapprochement between Turkey and the Arab world, that the Arabs would have a chance for maybe the first time in their history to have a serious look at Turkey's model of governance and hopefully adopt the positive parts of it <laughs> uh, uh, in how to incorporate all the political forces, including the Islamist forces, in a pluralistic uh, system. Uh, now, sir, you've been very patient. Thank you. Thank you, Sayyid Marwan. Uh, although I'm from a Palestinian background, 
my question is not going to be about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Instead, I work with the Ottawa police, and recently we have formed a committee to address the honor-based violence. You spoke of um, the that the Arab, the Arab world, to modernize, they have to uh, give women the equal rights and equal participation. What are your thoughts on, on the honor-based violence and how best to deal with it? And at the same time, if you could address the efforts that has been made to um, address the uh, tribal issues that exist with, that, uh, with the violence uh, perpetrated by these groups. Thank you, sir. Hello. I'm uh, Dave Comerford, President of the National Council on Canada-Arab Relations. Uh, we're hoping to organize a major conference in the fall on the, the whole issue of relations and key issues between Canada and the Arab world, and uh, what you've said today has been very inspiring. My question to you is, uh, do you not think that Arab moderation, one, is defined by the West, what, can, what, what constitutes moderation, and two, that that moderation has been bought, in most cases, uh, by Western governments. So if we look at those countries which do have peace agreements with Israel, uh, Egypt, Jordan, and other countries which have close relationships, Tunisia, Morocco, perhaps, uh, do you not think that if all of the other Arab countries also were bought, would we have peace today? Would we have a just solution? Okay. So that's my, that's my question. And two, if you have any suggestions about what would be an interesting national conference uh, on these issues, what issues would you put into a, a national conference in Canada to improve our relations with the Arab world? Thank you. Thank you. And sir, please. Okay. Um, my name is Misma Islam, and I'm from University of Ottawa, formerly. I have the same, same profession, uh, uh, the basic profession of Dr. Marshall. So my question is about the pragmatics. Uh, the pragmatics of the third way what is the timeline? Is it 50 years, 100 years, or 25 years? Um, uh, because, uh, because, uh, uh, because the timeline is very important. And, and being a computer man, a com computer person, we want actually milestones and vision and all that as well. So, so this is my c f first uh, question. The second question is about the, uh, why, would this, uh, why would the entrenched uh, elite buy your plan, or for, and why would United States buy your plan? Uh, because it's there in very much interest to have the status quo, and the status quo need not be disturbed at all. Thank you. Thank you. So Marwan, over to you. OK. Honor-based violence, I mean, the short answer is they're not honorable. <laughs> and. <laughs> At all, and and uh, and there must be uh, there must be a legal way to prevent, uh, not to prevent them, to to punish such crimes. Uh, it has uh, always been, uh, it has often been said, and I totally agree with it, that this is not religiously based. I mean, there's nothing in religion that supports honor, uh, uh, honor, so-called honor crimes. This is purely societal, uh, it's purely a social uh, phenomenon, and it doesn't, it's not just tribal in the sense of societies like Jordan, you know, it exists in other places like Egypt and, and throughout the rest, not only of the Arab world, but of that region as well. Uh, the, the problem uh, we've had in Jordan, frankly, is that on this issue, on this issue, not on all issues, the government, unfortunately, was more liberal than parliament. In other words, the government did put forward a, a law that would take away any uh, 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 reduced sentences for people com committing such crimes, but parliament wouldn't pass it. And, and that, that remains, uh, that remains uh, a, a huge problem that I'm hoping uh, things like education would be, uh, uh, would at least contribute to solving. Moderation and whether Arab states are bought or not. Uh, frankly, some Arab states don't need to be bought. They, uh, uh, they have more money than they know what to do with. 
but that has not brought them uh, moderation and reform. So I'm not sure the issue is a question of money. I think the issue is a question of interest. And unfortunately, I think the West has looked at their short-term security interests, and then in the process has uh, sacrificed their long-term interests in, uh, in maintaining uh, healthy uh, and prosperous societies and sustainable societies uh, in the Middle East. Timelines uh, and milestones. I mean, I agree with you on the need for timelines, but who can tell you whether it will take 50 or 100 years? I mean, I don't think this is an engineering problem, unfortunately, <laughs> <laughs> where, where, uh, where answers are in black and white uh, or in, in ones and zeros, I guess. Uh, 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 I, don't think, I don't think you can, uh, you can point out a specific time frame. I think what you can have is a sustained and serious plan that yes, might take, I don't care if it takes 30 or 50 years. What I do care about is a plan that is serious and sustained, not a collection of ad hoc programs that in the end don't add up to a reform process and don't result in any serious opening of the system. And why should the elite buy the plan? This is the, this is, this is the, <laughs> this is the core and most important question that I, among others, keep asking myself. Why should the elite buy this plan? I mean, my answer is that the elite has no other choice. In other words, if the elite thinks that the status quo is sustainable, they are in for a big surprise. Uh, I'm always um, reminded of the uh, guy who uh, falls off from the 10th floor. And on his way down, he meets uh, another guy who's sitting at the balcony of the first floor. And the guy on the balcony looks at this guy falling down and he says, good afternoon, sir, how is it going? And the guy falling down says, so far, so good. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that, uh, I don't think that this, the status quo, frankly, is sustainable. Now, how do you convince our, uh, governments uh, of this, I agree, is not is a tall order, uh, but we need to do it. I just don't 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 see any uh, any other way to do it, uh, uh, but to go through this gradual process. Great, Marwan. We have a question online from somebody following the discussion, Dr. Asim Makbul, who asks what strategy you would suggest to increase the level of integration of Middle Eastern countries with the rest of the world. And now let's go to a couple of others. So this, the, the issue is really integration of the Middle East with the rest of the world. Sir? Uh, good afternoon, Dr. Marshall. My name is uh, Dr. Prabir Niyogi. I work for the government of Canada, but I should state up front that I come from the Indian subcontinent. And mine is a three-part question. First, have you compared the experience in the Indian subcontinent from 47, 48 onwards to now compared to the Arab world? It's obvious to you why I choose that date. The second is, is part of the difference due to a difference in the educational system? Because what happened in India is we had four generations of essentially a British system of education, which created an educated middle class, quote unquote, of a fair size. The third question is this question of integration. That is the thinking in the Arab world in some way unique or cut off from the thinking of Muslim communities who live outside the Arab world. Because the largest number of Muslims don't live in the Arab world. They live in the Indian subcontinent and in Indonesia. Thank you, sir. Sir? <coughs> uh, thank you. I would like first to thank the IDRC for such a wonderful event. I'm from the Middle East, of a Sudanese origin. And um, we have a very bad experience of the Islamists who, I mean, took over in Sudan and overthrew democracy. And it is very unfortunate that the Islamists also infiltrate through the army and make coups and so on. And now they disintegrated or led to the disintegration of the largest country in Africa, or Afro-Arab country, actually. Um, 
Uh, Mr. Morwan, thank you very much. My first question is that Perhaps only one to let uh, us pass to other questioners also. Yeah, just the other, the number two is more important than number one, and number okay. one is more, also more important than number two. <laughs> <laughs> May I? <laughs> yeah. What is the role of the, ar of the army in um, having this regime uh, in Egypt continuing for years and years? Um, the role of the army is important. I don't know whether you agree with that, and uh, if you could add something. The, uh, the second question, my second question is that, since pressure from outside has brought some changes, as you said, I mean, uh, some reforms, um, do, you, uh, do you still uh, support that and also uh, um, uh, ask for it because also, the, the, the lesson in Iraq, which is still now in, uh, in chaos, uh, do you think the um, I mean, foreign support or foreign interference or, in, or uh, assistance, be military or be politically or be both? Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, I'm going to ask those standing now to remain, but no further questioners, please, to come forward, because our guest uh, has some time pressures and uh, uh, would not be able to take subsequent questions. So, Marwan, over to you on these. Well, on integration with the rest of the world, first of all, I mean, you know, globalization is not something that uh, you uh, choose. Uh, uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's something that you deal with. Uh, it's not something that uh, that you have a choice about. And I don't think the Arab region, uh, or any other region for that matter, will resist globalization provided they see uh, what benefits it brings. I remember in uh, Jordan in the mid '90s, when Jordan was attempting to. Uh, uh, entered the WTO, uh, the private sector, uh, as well as most of the population, were against Jordan entering the WTO because they thought that globalization is going to result in unfair competition for their own products. When we did join, and that did not happen, and people started to see the benefits of joining the WTO, when it was time in the late 90s to negotiate a free trade agreement, with the United States, the same parliament and business uh, 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 sector that was criticizing the government for uh, joining the WTO criticized it for its slow pace in negotiating an agreement with uh, a free trade agreement with the United States. So I don't think there is any ideological opposition that prevents, uh, you know, uh, or, or stands against uh, integration with the rest of the world. But at the same time, I go back to my original uh, uh, argument, which is that without political reform, okay, people are going to see integration with the global economy as a way to enrich the rich even further, rather than as a way to bring benefits to uh, the country at large. Your question about the Indian subcontinent in 1947, I assume you are talking about the different experiences of Pakistan and India. And, and, the, f the, and, and the fact that Pakistan is Muslim and India uh, is not, or is at least uh, not governed by. Um, if you look at the world today, and, and you're very right to uh, point out that the majority of Muslims in the world today live in non-Arab countries. Uh, if you look at India, if you look at Indonesia, if you look at Malaysia, uh, if you look at Turkey, uh, 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 if you look at Iran, the majority really do not live in Arab countries. And in many of these non-Arab countries, you know, there's a, uh, some form of democracy going on, some uh, uh, forms better than others. So, so Islam is certainly not an impediment to democratic uh, systems, uh, uh, as, as is evident from all these. 
why why does the arab world uh, you know why has the arab world not moved when every other uh, region has I mean, I wish, I wish you could give me the answer, because <laughs> we're all struggling with this. Is it its history of colonialism? Is it the Arab-Israeli conflict? Is it uh, a rentier system because of oil, where people don't pay taxes and therefore, you know, <laughs> don't ask for representation? What is it uh, about the Arab world that is so resilient? Uh, uh, to the contrary of every other region in the world that has moved. Latin America has moved, Sub-Saharan Africa has moved, Southeast Asia has moved. Only the Arab region is, is on governance issues is more or less where it used to be 20 years ago. Some people might even say uh, it has regressed. Um, role of the army. Well, I mean, it, the role of the army is not there in Sudan also. It is there in everywhere, really. It's whether it's the army, the intelligence services, I mean, this, uh, you name it. But, but uh, sadly, uh, uh, these are the protectors most of the time. And, uh, and uh, uh, in, in, in every Arab country, the army is more important than the civilian leadership. Uh, I, I know of no country where the army is less important than the civilian leadership. Maybe I'm, uh, if I'm wrong, please point it out. But on the question of outside pressure. Please, yes. l let's let our speaker. And the come. question of, of outside pressure, look, there was a time when there was very strong pressure from the outside in the early uh, part of, the, of this decade with the Greater Middle East Initiative, with the Bush Freedom Agenda, uh, et cetera, where there was very serious uh, pressure for some time. There was also a time of what I call weak pressure, agreements with the European Union on neighborhood policies, where, uh, where reform programs were collaboratively and jointly agreed to with uh, some Arab countries. And then there was ta a time of no pressure when after 2005, uh, and 2006, because of the election of Hamas and the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, outside pressure abated. And uh, frankly, the Obama administration has not picked up yet any serious uh, reform uh, uh, policy for the Arab world. But in all these cases, whether there was strong pressure, weak pressure, or no pressure, the result has been the same, which is that Arab states have become very uh, uh, s smart about abating this, uh, uh, you know, this pressure in one way or the other, either by, uh, either by uh, uh, responding with ad hoc programs that don't add up really to a reform process, or, or through uh, rhetoric, or through no reform process at all. But I, I don't, you know, I don't also subscribe to outside pressure, pressure a la, you know, invasion of Iraq uh, model. Uh, that's, not, uh, uh, that's not a way to uh, bring about reform. Reform must be, uh, must be homegrown. But I think there is uh, lots of shades of gray between no pressure whatsoever and between uh, pressure a la uh, Bush administration's model. I think there are other ways in which in which there can be collaboration between the international community and the countries uh, at hand, in which there is an understanding that no reform process can uh, result in a democratic society overnight, and therefore, necessarily, it must be a gradual one. But once again, adding that a gradual process must also be a serious one and a sustained one, and not a process that can end uh, in, a, in a year or two, depending on uh, you know, the kind of pressure that, uh, that exists. Thank you very much. Uh, and also to the questioners. Now, we have five uh, individuals uh, standing at the microphones. Could I ask each of you to be quite brief, and perhaps only one question for uh, our speaker? Sir. Thank you. My name is Bruno Lagasse. I'm an international development economist. I've worked in the 
in North Africa and in many parts of Africa. Um, it seems to me that the key, or one of the keys of your talk is acceptance of political, religious, and social diversity. Um, the ultimate acceptance of those three um, would be, it seems to me, uh, the acceptance of the diversity of the Palestinians and the Israelis, which would make for a federated state, whatever. I think we're kidding ourselves, and we continue, and we seem to want to continue to kid ourselves that there's going to be a two-state solution to this thing. There is no way, with all the developments scattered all over the West Bank and what is happening in, 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 uh, in Gaza, a two-state solution to me doesn't exist. I would like your comment on that. Thank you. Sir? Thank you. My name is Bruce Moore. I'm on the board of directors of the Forum for Democratic Global Governance, whose work is led by Southern civil society in trying to open up spaces for dialogue with the countries of the Organization of the Islamic Conference. Given your indication of emerging opportunities, or at least the values, as this gentleman has just mentioned, of inclusion, pluralism, and peaceful, peaceful approaches, what advice would you give to Southern civil society as they try to open more space for dialogue with political elites in some of the countries that you have been describing? Thank you. Sir? Uh, my name is Chris Tucker. My background is in uh, multidimensional risk modeling and natural hazards. Some years ago, um, IDRC was involved in studies of water rights and riparian water within the Middle East. Uh, and there were some books published on that were very interesting. I'm curious if you think, or what do you think, about these sort of bigger issues, water, depletion of petroleum, as well in the longer term, middle term future, how that might impact on the uh, regional and global politics as it might affect that. Is there, is there some chance that bigger issues can bring some consolidation or common thinking to peoples to fight sort of broader issues than um, local politics and religion? Thank you. Ma'am? Yes, uh, Margaret Brady, I'm from the British Council. Um, we're very interested in intercultural dialogue, and I was wondering if uh, there's any chance that through the arts and, and sciences, for example, can we improve the communications with the Arab world and help affect any changes? Thank you, and sir? Uh, hi, my name's Eric Bieber. I'm a fourth year politics student from Queen's University. Um, first of all, I just want to say thank you for a very insightful and interesting talk. Um, I personally have a very keen interest in Middle Eastern politics and Western relations uh, with the Middle East. And uh, my question was regarding educational reform. You uh, made a very clear emphasis on the need for it to help further the case of Arab moderation. Also, at the same time, you um, placed a need on, or sorry, placed an emphasis on how the uh, Arab-Israeli conflict is an impediment to Arab moderation. I was just wondering um, what your stance is on sort of Israeli reform for its own education system vis-a-vis -vis its sort of anti-Arabic and Iranophobic sort of sentiments to help further a more moderate stance. Thank you. So. Great. Another great set of questions. <laughs> Two-state solution. My diplomatic answer uh, is that it is at, at its deathbed. <laughs> <laughs> That's the optimistic answer. And so, sir, I, I, I do agree with you that the chances for a two-state solution are becoming very remote, uh, to say the least. Uh, those who are not yet ready to declare the death of the two-state solution do that because the other uh, alternatives so far seem either unrealistic in the short term or more problematic. A one-state solution, for example, that people, uh, some people have uh, started to, to talk about in both camps, 
in both camps, people like Moshe Arons in Israel, as well as people like Sarin Sebe in Palestine. But there is still a majority on both sides, according to the most recent polls, that uh, uh, state that uh, the absolute majority in both sides prefer a two-state solution. How do you implement it with uh, the settlement, uh, uh, the set settlements and the settler in the West Bank? Honestly, I don't know. Uh, we have moved from a situation in 1993 when Oslo was signed, where we had 250,000 settlers in the West Bank and Jerusalem to a situation today where we have over 500,000 out of a population of 2 million. So 25% of the West Bank today uh, is Israeli settlers. How do, you, how do you solve it is indeed an extremely uh, difficult question, uh, but maybe less difficult, at least so far, may be less difficult than some of the other alternatives uh, that have been. You might, uh, you, we might have a debate about this. Civil society. Civil society in the Arab world is still constrained by laws that require civil society to, you know, check in with the state before they do anything. Right? So before they can criticize the state, they're supposed to get uh, <laughs> a green light from the state to be able to do anything. Be and as such, as such uh, uh, civil society in the Arab world so far, for the large part, has been either co-opted by governments or constrained from doing any serious oversight political work. And many civil society groups in the Arab world are today focusing their activities on welfare activities rather than on, you know, advocacy and, and, and reform uh, issues. Ironically, where civil society is strongest in the Arab world is where the state is weakest. And so if you look at Palestine, if you look at Lebanon, you find an extremely thriving civil society because the state is weak and has not been able to basically exercise its, <laughs> its, uh, its, uh, its authority. Uh, 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 when we did the national agenda in Jordan, uh, um, one of the main uh, one of the main recommendations was a new civil society law that would not uh, have civil society uh, be accredited by the government to start its work sadly that has never been translated into law. that recommendation has has never been translated into law water rights uh, and how it impacts things in the future. In Arabic, we have a, we have a proverb, and I'll try to uh, translate it. Inna al gharika la yakhsha min al balali. Which means that when you're drowning, okay, <laughs> you're not worried about getting wet. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yes, water rights are very important, and but people don't honestly have the luxury of thinking about this when they are under occupation. They don't have the luxury of thinking about, let's worry about climate change. Let's worry about the environment. Let's worry, these are all very, very important issues and that need you know, people to be concerned about, but not when you are under occupation and you're trying to deal with more existential challenges than, uh, than uh, whether you have enough water or not, uh, frankly. Same applies to intercultural dialogue. Yes, the arts help. Everything helps. Uh, uh, the, 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 the problem that I see is that when we started this process 20 years ago in Madrid, you know, people felt that there was time for track two diplomacy, people to people interaction, getting people to know each other uh, through the arts, through exchange programs, through uh, 
camps like Seeds of Peace through a multitude of activities that were designed to bring the people closer together uh, while they search for a solution. What I'm afraid of today is time has run out. And therefore, while all these activities are very important, we simply do not have the time uh, to arrive at a settlement if we want a two-state solution. We, we don't have the time so that these activities can kick in and, and act as a catalyst for an agreement when an agreement might not be possible in a very, very short period of time. The gentleman here will tell me it's already not possible. And finally, on the Israeli reform system, I mean, uh, th this uh, uh, lecture was about, I, I have focused my attention about uh, some of the major challenges facing the Arab world. I hope that uh, by doing so, I did not mean to give the impression that Israel has a rosy picture, whether it comes to education reform or, or this is not a sort of a, you know, a zero sum game. I'm not trying to, uh, I'm not trying to belittle what exists in Israeli society. And in, in my own view, and I was uh, Jordan's uh, first ambassador to Israel, Israel's education system has a long way to go, not just in terms of its treatment of Arab, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's Palestinian uh, 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 people under occupation, but also in terms of its treatment of its own Arab Palestinians who have Israeli citizenship. And I will go further, and also in its treatment of its jo own Jewish community that today has layers in Israeli society of uh, 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 how, how do I even say this uh, diplomatically? I don't know. <laughs> But all I want to say is, is yes, Israel has a long way to go, uh, just uh, uh, in, in, in terms of, of, of a narrative that uh, identifies the rights of Arabs and Palestinians in particular, uh, 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 rather than the exclusive, the exclusivist uh, or exclusionist uh, position of the Israeli government and society in pretending as if the Palestinians just, you know, came out of nowhere, had no rights uh, to the land when they, in fact, were the uh, uh, owners of that land. So, I mean, I, I, I don't want to, uh, to um, engage in a, in a, in a debate that, uh, to, to, bo to bolster my, my, uh, my uh, credentials on that front. I have a lot to say about Israel. Uh, uh, but that was not the object of uh, this uh, lecture. Thank you. Great. Marwan? Thank you very much. You made a huge number of interesting points. One of them that resonated with me was that uh, whatever change comes to the Arab world has to come from within. And so it's individuals like yourself, uh, other Arabs, who um, will make this happen or it won't happen. Um, it's uh, always been uh, a privilege for IDRC to uh, support efforts by Arabs to shape their own societies uh, in, uh, through evidence-based research. Um, and I think you set an example for um, uh, others in your part of the world. You also set an example for those of us in Canada who struggle, we struggle with our own uh, problems of integration, inclusion, uh, and so on. So we don't come at these issues with any particular sense of superiority, rather a sense of actually how difficult change is. And you challenge us <laughs> on that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.